It's generally accepted by the overwhelming majority of the world, from scientific and governmental people to regular folks in the street, there's something pretty screwy going on with the weather. Once in a generation floods, fires and droughts are happening with increasing regularity, habitats for some of the most vulnerable species on our planet are disappearing, and the cause of all of this is the increasing record levels of greenhouse gases in the atmosphere that we humans are spewing into the air, which is in turn affecting the climate, which affects weather patterns on this tiny blue dot we call home. With ever-increasing urgency, the majority of the world's governments are trying to do everything they possibly can to reduce greenhouse gas emissions to around 80% of what they currently are in just 30 years. Without that reduction, we're told, our world gets a very difficult place for us humans to live. It's why we're seeing incentives for electric cars, photovoltaic solar panels, and investment around the world into cleaner, more sustainable ways of living. And while governmental policy can change the way we live to some extent, it's not super sustainable or popular for governments to dictate what their citizens do. Which is where carbon pricing comes in. It offers a way for society to take into account the true material, social and environmental costs of the way we live our lives. And it could help us transition to a lower carbon economy in a very, very effective way. In its simplest form, carbon pricing isn't about forcing people to make a transition to cleaner, greener ways of living. Instead, it just wants to make people aware of the costs associated with their chosen transportation or energy generation method. And it balances the scales so everything is then on an even playing field. You see, since the Industrial Revolution, we've not paid the true cost for energy goods and products we use. We've focused on how much it costs to generate or produce the thing we're buying with some added money on top for the producer or generator in order that they may get a profit. But as anyone who's lived in LA the last 30 years or so, or visited a Chinese megacity, or perhaps even remembered what it was like in London in the 1950s, any emissions or gases produced in the process of making the thing we're buying or traveling to the place we want to go, or generating the energy we need to use, have an effect on the world around us. Air pollution leads to increased mortality rates among the vulnerable in our society. It increases the occurrence of respiratory conditions such as asthma. And of course, it helps trap more heat in the atmosphere, which warms up our planet. If you've got more people suffering from health problems because of poor air quality, you've got more people taking time off work or school, or perhaps finding it harder to do their jobs. You've got more people visiting the doctors and not working. That lowers GDP and increases overall costs to the community. It can even affect things like air conditioning and cooling systems in buildings and vehicles, because if the air is physically dirtier due to poor air quality, you'll need to change your air filters more often, increasing the operating costs of whatever it is that you're operating. And if the weather patterns are more unpredictable due to climate change, more people will find themselves taking time off work, often unpaid, when a major catastrophic or once in a generation seemingly happening every year weather event happens. If we account for all of these negative consequences in terms of true financial impact to society, the price we pay for things would be higher than it currently is. And that's where carbon pricing comes in. Rather than take the material costs of something into consideration, it bundles in societal costs, both upstream and downstream, based on the total carbon emissions of making the thing or generating the thing or driving the thing. Rather than give taxpayer subsidies to industries like oil and gas, or in fact, renewable energy programs, it allows consumers to figure out how they want to spend their money. In short, it means that consumers are free to choose the best option based on overall impact to themselves, their families and their friends, which will also be the cheapest option because it will be the option that produces the least emissions. And rather than asking consumers to understand carbon emissions in terms they don't understand, I mean, really, does anyone know what a ton of carbon dioxide looks like? It adds on a price of whatever it is that consumers are buying or using based on the net emissions generated to do or make the thing. Does it work? Yes. Absolutely. Carbon pricing policy has been in place in many places around the world, including Sweden, which introduced carbon pricing in 1991 at a price of $33 per tonne. Today, Swedes pay $160 per tonne of carbon dioxide produced, and it's helped reduce emissions nationwide by 25% while simultaneously boosting GDP by 60%. Meanwhile, the Canadian province of British Columbia has been using carbon pricing since 2008. 
In that time, the province has experienced a massive economic growth, yet it's also dropped its per capita emissions 3.5 times faster than the national average. So there you have it. That's carbon pricing in a nutshell. Rather than force lower income households to bear the brunt of the effects of a lack of regard for emissions, let's face it, historically, those with money are those who can escape inner cities or buy exceptional healthcare. It shares the burden across society and puts the consumer in control of what they buy and use. That's it. Thanks for joining me. See you next time.